Good morning to all. Can we open up our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 12? 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 to 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast... I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in body I do not know or whether out of body I do not know, God knows, such as one caught up to the third heaven. I know such a man, whether in body or out of body I do not know, God knows. How he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such one I will boast. Yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. But I refrain lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. A messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you and my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Here we have the Apostle Paul talking about himself. He went to the third heaven. He saw things that were inexpressible to words. And... We read what happens then. He saw all these amazing things and God allowed a thorn to be in his life to keep him humble so that he doesn't boast about the, who he is and who he was. But this thorn would act to keep him humble. And what we see that he didn't like it. The Apostle Paul didn't like this thorn. And he prayed th- three times for the thorn to be taken away. Take it away, Lord. I don't like it. It's a hindrance to my life. It causes me a lot of grief and pain, distress. But the Lord said these words to him. My grace is sufficient for thee. And with that understanding of what Paul went through, it's interesting how we're not given details, exact details, what this thorn was. Or what it is. We don't know. And there are varied commentators who say it's X, Y, Z. The real thing is this. That it's good that he doesn't tell us what it is. That the spirit of God through the word of God doesn't reveal what it is. Because each one of us can fit in the shoes of Paul. And each one of us can say what Paul says. Lord this thorn that I've got in my life. Lord, take it away. That's a desire for all of us. And take it away, Lord, because I don't like it. And we hear those words to us. My grace is sufficient for thee. A thorn. Each one of us here has a thorn or thorns and they change through life and they evolve. But one thing about thorns is they cause Pain. Okay, pain. Now, through the life cycle that we go through, each stage of our life, we will have thorns. Whether you're a young kid going to school and you're being picked on by somebody, that's a thorn. 
Then you grow up and you're worried about education and that becomes a thorn because it gives you sleepless nights sometimes. Then you grow up and say, oh, get married and then that becomes a thorn because it's not, you've got to work that out. And then you want to have children and then the life cycle continues and then become a grandparent and then death comes along and there's thorns everywhere. And my thorns are different to your thorns. You know, if I told you one of my thorns that's in my life, you'd, say, you'd laugh. But it's my thorn. And it hurts me. And you've got your thorn. And that hurts you. And there are thorns everywhere. And where you can ask this question, where do these thorns come from? And the answer, the answer is in Genesis. And in Genesis, we read what happens. We read. In chapter 3, we read... Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth. It's endemic in this world. It's everywhere. It's not only in the, the soil. It's around our life. And we get an explanation how this thorn evolves. Uh, we read about it in Numbers. that It's not only something that thorns and thistles. You can physically see a thorn and a thistle. And it causes you grief when you're, when you're trying to grow crops and they were trying to eat. Simple thing to do. But this thorn has evolved around us and it involves a lot more than what's in the soil. And we read about this in Numbers, how it's evolved. In Numbers, the Lord God says to the Israelites, But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land before you, then it shall be that those whom you let remain shall be irritants in your eyes and thorns in your sides. And they shall harass you in the land where you dwell. Moreover, it shall be that I will do to you as I thought to do to them. So here we have... A evolution, if I use that word, of the thorn. Now, all of a sudden, this thorn, these people become a thorn in the Israelite side. They become a pain to them. And when we think about our own lives, just think about the thorns for a moment. Maybe it's a health issue. Maybe it can be a variety of issues, a health issue, a work-related issue. Every day we go to work and there's always a problem. And sometimes the problems are more than what they should be. And we see them in their, their thorns. They are painful because that's what thorns do. They cause pain. And we read about, you know, an explanation of thorns. And when the thorn is mentioned here to Apostle Paul, it actually uh, doesn't necessarily relate to a physical thorn. It, it talks about the fact that it can be a, a, a spear, a sharp piece of wood, a stake, a sharp stake, a splinter, something that causes the person pain. You know, the Apostle Paul says, you know, he, the, Satan used the thorn to buffet me. It buffeted him. It was pressed in hard on the side. And it causes us grief and suffering. And it is there. It is endemic. We can run away from it, but it's there. We can hide, try to hide from it, it's there. You turn to certain places and you want relief from the thorns. Lord, relieve me of this drama I'm going through. And we hear those words, and we should hear those words, my grace is sufficient for thee. One of the greatest thorns, one of those, when I say greatest, I use that in terms of the enormity of it all and the, the destructive nature of a thorn is relationships between people. We can be thorns to each other. You know what? I could be your thorn, and sometimes I am. And you are my thorn, and sometimes you are. And that is the nature of human life. We are thorns to each other. And the way we respond to those thorns is the key to victory. It's the key to victory. You can either be eternally suffering from the thorns 
and the buffeting thereof, or you can have victory through God against the thorn. And I'm going to use this example, and I'm going to go into it a bit of depth. Two people in the Bible, each of them thorns to each other. Each of them. But the way they reacted to the thorn and to the suffering and to the to the angst was polar opposites. They were completely on different wavelengths. One person and the other person interrelated. David and Saul. David and Saul. Each of them were each other's thorns. And they were. And we see, if we look at, I I suggest you read 1 Samuel, the whole chapter, and you'll see how it all evolves. And you'll see, you know, the chapter in 2 Samuel is named after the prophet Samuel. And he chooses two kings. People wanted a king. All right. Saul's a king. Saul became king and then he disobeyed God. Instead of being a God-fearing man, he became a political activist. He started doing deals. God told him, you know that king, King Agag? Kill him. Get rid of him. Don't take his sheep. But you know what Saul did? Saul did this. No, I'm not going to kill him. I reckon I can use him later on. Political maneuvering that happens and so God rejected him I told you to do that and what's the the Samuel says to him what's the bleeding of sheep I hear I thought you gonna do what you said you were gonna do oh I thought I'd keep a couple for myself personal gain over what God wanted him to do then God rejected him then there was a shepherd boy. His name's David, and we know the story well. We're from Sunday school. David for Goliath, and he relied on God. And the first interaction they had, Saul and David, was uh, one of the most intimate was when David wanted to fight Goliath, and Saul said, you know what? Take my armor, put it on, and fight. And, he, you know, David put on the armor. Man, he couldn't even walk. It was so burdensome and so forth. Okay, so I'm not going to wear this. I'm going to fight the Lord the way the Lord tells me. So he fought and he won and he became victorious. And people started praising David. And they said, Saul has killed thousands, but David has killed tens of thousands. This got into the ear of Saul. And from that day on, David was a thorn to Saul. And it was incrementally, as we'll see, incrementally painful to him. At the same time, David, all of a sudden he's developed an enemy in Saul. And Saul now was his thorn. And so we have this moving on and we have this life of them together. And uh, the Bible says that a dis- distressing, distressing spirit was sent to Saul and he couldn't function properly. So he calls David and he says, David, you know, play the harp and uh, that soothed him. And then out of nowhere, you see something, you know, rage. Saul gets the spear and he thrusts it to kill David. What for? Because he became a thorn. He heard what the people were saying about him. All of a sudden, you know, he was getting, David was getting all the accolades. You know, Saul's pride was being hurt. All of a sudden, you see this, this tension happening and that people were starting saying more positive things about David than, than against Saul. And the Bible says, Saul eyed David from that day forward. He was very angry and displeased in, in him. And what we have, we have this interaction between the two. And we see that that, uh, David and Saul interacted. David acted wisely, the Bible says. And Saul didn't act wisely. And he acted wisely. And then what we see this, Saul's got a daughter, Merab. 
He says to David, you know what? I'm going to give you my daughter. Anyway, Mara, Mara married somebody else, turn of events. Then we have another daughter, Michal. Michal. And Michal loved David. And Saul said, you know, he looked at it as a, as a case of a way to get David. And he says to David, yeah, you can have my daughter. You can be the king. And in fact, what, what the Saul did, he sent some of his men to David to egg him on. You know, this is deceptive stuff. To talk to him, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you should marry her because, you know, you could become the king's, you know, son-in-law and, and you can do all this. And, you know, David, oh, but I, I want to marry her. And, you know, David and Saul got together and Saul said to him, you know, what, you want to marry my daughter? No worries. Beautiful. What you're going to do now, you've got to go get a hundred Philistines. You've got to kill them. And by doing this, Saul hoped that the Philistines were going to kill him to get rid of him. And so we see a turn of events. David comes back and he's got, he killed 200 Philistines. He marries Michal. He marries her and he says to, to her, and now he becomes the son-in-law and he wanted him to be defeated by the Philistines because that was his aim, political manoeuvring to do what he wanted to do, to get rid of David. I'll give him my daughter, but you know what? You're going to face the Philistines. The Philistines are going to belt you. They're going to kill you. In fact, they worked the other way. When he was put in a position of being against the Philistines, he defeated them. It's a bit like what happens in the book of Esther. And we see what happened there, that Mordecai was supposed to be hung upon the, the uh, cross or the, the tree that was set up for him, but it worked out the other guy. The other guy, Haman, was, was killed in his place. We have this continual discussion and we have this continual fighting between the two. David is innocent, but Saul is after him. And he marries Michal and he says to Michal and he says to David, now oh, he's going to get David again. He's in his house. And word gets back to his wife, Michal, and says, David, they're going to kill you. His men are coming to get you. And then David says, oh, what am I going to do? And his wife says, jump out the window, run away. And what the wife did was she did this. Michal, she got a dummy. She put horse hair on it, put clothes on it, put it in the bed. And when, the, uh, when Saul's men came to kill him, uh, they said, oh, it's, it's uh, David, he's sick in bed. And they waited, and then they worked out that it wasn't. It was a dummy. It was a, an opportunity for him to get killed. But he left, and he was rescued. And all this time, you've got to ask yourself, we know what is in the heart of Saul. We know his attitude to the thorn that he's got. What was David thinking? What was David thinking? And we have got a record of what David was thinking. If you could turn with me to the book Psalm, Psalm 59. What was David doing when he was being chased and, and being attacked by Saul? Psalm 59. And it says, A Mitchum of David, when Saul sent men and they watched the house in order to kill him. This is what David was doing. Deliver me from my enemies, my God. Defend me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from workers of iniquity. Save me from bloodthirsty men. For look, they lie and wait for my life. The mighty gather against me, not for my transgressions, nor my sin, O Lord. They run and prepare themselves, no fault of mine. You see what's happening here? David is calling out to God. He's calling out. He can see the, the him being chased and harassed. Well, this is why God loved David. Because in his hour of distress, he prayed to God. He went to the Lord. He was asking for the Lord's thing. And he explained exactly what was happening. You know, sometimes we have these rope prayers 
that we pray along the lines, you know, Lord, be with me, guide me, bless me, you know, um, you know uh, our daily bread and, you know, uh, our Lord's prayer we say. But here is an intense prayer of the heart. And God answers an intense prayer of the heart. He was going to pray. And the lesson we learn here is that when we have thorns in our lives, we go to prayer to God. We go to prayer. And there, brothers and sisters, we find grace. We find the grace of God to sustain us. Only in that temple of prayer, in a temple of humbleness, that temple of going to God and asking him, Lord God, help me, there are enemies around me, there, there you find grace from God. It's the spiritual oxygen. It's the uh, power that a person gets. A person who's born again by the Spirit of God still needs to go to God. Well, I go to God and say, Lord, this is my problem. And he finds grace. And that grace is able for him to continue on and to live the Christian life. David does not respond to Saul. He doesn't respond and attack him. In fact, as we read on, you see quite the opposite. Because grace changes a person's heart. Grace is like can take all the bullets for us. Grace is what sustains us. The, the presence of God, the power of God, the, the fact that a person can be enlightened, enlightened with the power of God to see things for what they are, to see things and to comprehend that God is in control. The question we've got to this morning is that, is God in control? Even when there's thorns all around us, is he in control? Does he sustain us? Is he able to do that? And the answer, the answer is yes. We have another incident, another incident. And we see David r running now. He's escaping. So this, he got chased out of his house and now he's running further and further away. And he grabs a whole group of men and they go and they encamp. They go into a cave. They go into a cave, the Bible says. And they, it was in the wilderness of Endonith. 3,000 men went with Saul. About 400 men were with David. They're in the cave. Saul was chasing him down like a dog. He wanted to catch him like a, like a rabbit in a particular place. He was, he was putrid with him. He was going to kill him. And what happens was Saul went to the cave. David was in there and his men were in the recesses of the cave, the Bible says, at the back and in, the, in all the pockets. And Saul, lo and behold, comes in to relieve himself, to go to the toilet. And so he's there doing what he's doing. And his men, this is David's men, David's men said to him, here is your chance. The Lord has delivered him. He's delivered him to you. All the men could see and all the people around there could see the way that Saul was persecuting him. The Lord has delivered him and he is there. He's there ready for the killing. But David, the Bible says, arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And he said, you know what, I... I'm going to do this thing, but I can't do anything worse because he's the Lord's anointed. And Lord's anointed. Saul goes out of the cave. He's out in a distance. And then what we see is that David gets up and he says, he says these words, my Lord, my king, calls out from the other side. And he, then what happened was that Saul, David stooped down on his face on the earth and bowed down. And he said to them, why do you listen to the words of those who say, indeed, David seeks to harm you? Look at this day. Your eyes have seen that the Lord has delivered you from my hand. And some have urged me, the others urged me to kill you, but I spared you. And now I've got this part of your robe to show that I could have killed you, but I couldn't. I didn't. 
because you're the Lord's anointed. And the, 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 we read later on that even David regretted that he cut off part of the robe because he did not want to hurt his God's anointed person. And there's another psalm that talks about his experience there. Another psalm and how he was hunted down by, by Saul. And it says here, and, and again, he's hunted in the cave. He's in the cave. And it says here, a Mitchum of David when he fled from Saul into the cave. And this is his prayer. I'm saying this because this is the way we have to respond to things. Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me. For my soul trusts in you, and in the shadow of your wings I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed by. I cry out to God my most high, to God who will perform all these things. He shall send from heaven and save me. His reproach, the one who will swallow me up. God, God send forth his mercy and his truth. That's his prayer. Again, another prayer. Not just the one prayer, but a series of prayers calling out to God in his drama. Again, Saul looks at the situation and says, Oh, David, you are much better than me. David, you're going to be king one day. David, you, you're a better person than I can ever be. And Saul leaves him for a moment. Then Saul comes back again and chases him again. And now Saul is camped on uh, Mount Achalia. He's camped there. And the Lord God sends a, sends a sleep upon them. David, with one of his army soldiers, Abishir, goes into the camp. And there Saul is in the middle of the camp, right in the middle. All his army around him. There's a spear there and there's a jug of water. And Abishai, his trusted friend, says to him, you know what, I'm going to kill him now. I'm going to get the spear... I only need one blow. I'm going to get him right between the eyes. And I'm going to pin him to the soil. You know what? David would have thought, I wonder if they would have thought, or maybe we would have thought this. Oh, yeah. Saul, he threw a spear at me two times. He deserves it. Go, Bashar, kill him. David said, no way. You shall not touch the Lord's anointed. And we have a series of other incidents that happen. And while Saul, while David was going to God, Saul was not going to God. Saul, the Bible says, the Spirit of the Lord left him. And what he did from there was that something despicable. He went to a sorceress, a medium. And what he was doing was that he couldn't even approach God. He wanted to get rid of his thorn. So he's trying to find out a way to do it. So he goes to the medium and he asks for Samuel because he wanted Samuel's advice. He was going back to the old days. He was looking back and he's saying, that's the way I'm going to solve my problem. Go look backwards and look at what I did in the past. That's going to be, I'll call Samuel. You know what he should have done? He should have called out to the Lord, but he didn't. And we see an incident there where the spirit of Saul, supposedly, it may not be because of the, the facts of the situation, and he is in a worse state than all. He goes to battle. He, he fights the Philistines. This is Saul. He is up against them. They've surrounded him. His armor bearer is there. And he says to his armor bearer, listen, I'm gone. Kill me now. And his armor bearer says, no, I can't kill you. I cannot kill you. And he says, kill me because the Philistines are going to get me. And he said, I can't. And we have that famous phrase today, even today, it's used today. Saul fell on his sword and died. The armor bearer saw her and he fell on his sword and died. Word gets back to David. You would have thought, and I would have thought, and maybe I would have, you know, inside of me said, praise the Lord. Saul's dead. Praise the Lord. But what did David do? David cried his guts out. He cried his guts out that Saul was dead. His thorn was gone. And he cried 
for the Lord's anointed. David now, problem solved. No thorn. Saul's gone. He lived this life. It was full of blessings. God told him to do the, build the temple. Or he wanted to build a temple. God said no. But his, his kingdom uh, expanded. He went to the palace. And everything was beautiful. No thorns whatsoever. He was king of the kingdom. And the Bible says a particular evening when men and soldiers went out to fight, he stayed home in the palace. And he looked over and there was Bathsheba and he did the sin with Bathsheba. He got her pregnant. He, he got Uriah, the husband, and he, he brought him back and he tried to get Uriah to sleep with his wife so that the baby can be his. Now that was enough. Tried to get him drunk. And as we heard last night, all the events that were happening, but that wasn't enough and he didn't do it. And he was scheming. And then he calls Joab, his general, he says, Job, you know, when Uriah starts fighting with there, this is what I want you to do. I want you to put him at the front of the line. And when he's at the front and the Philistines are attacking, pull the soldiers back. He's dead meat. How could he do this? After all the things that God had done to him. And we know the story. Nathan the prophet tells him the story about that man who had a, a hundred lambs. And he's having a big party. And, he, and there's a guy who's only got the one little lamb. And he, he gets the one little lamb. And he uses that for his party. Rather than one of his own. And Nathan says to David. Because David's in rage. And he says that man should die. It's despicable what he did. And then we see Nathan says those famous words. You are that man. You are that man. And then his whole demeanour, his whole life just crashed around him. You know what this story of David and Saul tells me? We need thorns. We need thorns to keep us humble. We need thorns around us and the Lord uses them because when there are thorns and they hurt, there's only two places you could go. Downhill, like Saul, or up like David originally did. He went to God. And the grace of God was sufficient for him. We need people who disagree with us. We need people... And I need people against me. And so do you. Because that put, and unjustly, even if they're unjustly pursuing and doing the wrong thing. Because in all those circumstances, we put our trust in God and we pray to him. And it's not a, and as I said, the way David prayed was that, you know, the end, this was real prayer, being chased. And being relying on God, only God, you know, in psalm after psalm, only you can deliver me. Only you can deliver me. Only you can guide me, Lord. And, he, and that's what happens when we understand that the thorns around us, God will not take them away. Even if they seem unjust, even if they seem unfair, they are there. We are thorns. You're my thorn. And I'm your thorn sometimes. And we have an understanding that that's the way we're going to function sometimes. We're going to be in opposition to certain things and understanding because we are fault, we're people who are faulty. We are people who do this thing. And we understand that thorns have an impact. Thorns do these things. Who's your thorn? Who's my thorn? All of us who are born again with the Spirit of God have the Spirit. Or we're anointed in a particular way. We have God within us. Each one of us has gifts different to others. Maybe your thorn is a preacher. Maybe it's a Presby member. And maybe you've got full right to say what you say. And I've got full right to say what I want to say. 
But we need to comprehend that we need to act like David and not like Saul. We need to bring the circumstance and the thorn before God, say his grace can overcome us. David was unjustly being attacked. And he had all the right. I mean, in the court of law, David could have said, you know, I didn't do this, I didn't do this, I didn't do this. Why are you chasing me for? Why are you persecuting me for? But he didn't. He went to God. And with that comprehension, the things that are around us at the moment, we need to go to the Lord. No use blaming each other. You know, there's a couple of people who left church and there's always people leaving church. And we have uh, this scenario that, oh, well, I can't handle it anymore. I'm leaving. I've had enough. That's the attitude of Saul. David would say, Lord God, I don't comprehend any of this, but Lord God, I come before you and I pray before you and I ask for your guiding hand upon me. Because there's two ways we could go with our issue, either down or up. The Bible talks about the sower who went out to sow. And he sowed on all those different types of soil. And one soil that he sowed upon, some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. And the disciples didn't understand or comprehend, and so Jesus had to explain. And he says to them, Now he who received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, but the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. You know, that's a danger that each one of us can suffer, that the thorns choke us. Because they do. Because we're so focused on the thorn, the cares of who we are, the pride and the ego, they compress us. We become slaves to those thorns. They hurt. And this is what happens with the sower. The seed was useless. And it says here, and the cares among the th- cares of the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. That's when thorns win. But God wants us that grace wins. Grace wins in our life. Grace wins. Driving to Walkerville many times, on the left-hand side, just after Lang Lang, I always see this sign. And the sign is the Holden Proving Ground. And I've always fascinated myself, but I can't see anything. You ever drive on the way to Walkerville, you see Holden, there's a sign, Holden Proving Ground. And it's all bush. Recently it was sold. And it's a huge development in there. There's 44 kilometres of roadworks and basically all different terrain, whether it's a bumpy road, whether it's a slippery road, whether it's a speed track, whether it's a mountain top, all different types of uh, roads have got in there. And they test all the cars before they put them out on the market. Church is like that a little bit. We come here and we live this life and we're confronted by all these different thorns and all these different people and all these different issues. And it's a a proving ground. And this is the way it is. That what happens is that will the word of God so dominate our life and his grace so dominate our life that we will overcome, that we will be victorious in Christ. Whatever the world and anybody does to us, Jesus is king. And his grace is sufficient for you and I. His grace becomes sufficient for you and I. Will grace prevail? Will grace win? Does grace win? And the beautiful grace of Jesus, we've spoken and we sing about it. We sing about it. And it says in Jesus, and we sing about what he does and that grace and how beautiful that grace is. 
and how that grace is so wonderful for us. We're living in a time of grace, remember this. Before Jesus came, there was no grace. And people were getting killed and God's vengeance was there and people were being destroyed. Look at Noah. Look at the times of David and Saul. Look what was happening there. We're living in a time of grace where grace is abundantly available to us. The Apostle Paul says this, because of the exceeding grace of God in you, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Undescribable gift of grace. Of grace in our life. We sang a song, I think it was the last one. And the last song that we sang talked about our Lord and Saviour. He had thorns on his head. The symbolism is quite stark. All the thorns of the world upon his head. They took him and they put him on a cross. And then the, the soldier, what did he do? He got a spear. And I'm thinking of the thorn. I'm thinking of Saul. I'm thinking of all those things. And he gets the spear and he, in the side, thorn in the side, spear in my side. We sing a song. And from that, the blood poured out. Grace poured out. The church was being going to be built upon his blood. Now we see that Jesus Christ took all the thorns and through his obedience, there was victory. There was victory to, to Jesus. And most importantly for us is that we can have victory in Jesus Christ because of his grace. There are thorns everywhere. There are thorns all over. Maybe tonight you'll go home, today you'll go home and you'll, you'll suffer one from one of them. I'm a reminder in the mind. Oh no, not that again. But you've got to remember this. It's how the way we respond to the thorn. And understand this, that God's word says, my grace is sufficient for thee and me and yea, and all of us. God's word is powerful. It is the light unto our path. And we can see through God's word what each one of us needs to do. Don't act like Saul. Act like David, for me too, with all the faults all of us have got. Act like David, not like Saul. May God bless his word in our hearts this morning. Amen.